Greetings in the name of the Lord. Bonae swasifiwe. I take this opportunity to appreciate the gift of life and to appreciate the father and mother of the house even to give me an opportunity like this to share and bring to you God's word. Amen. I also want to thank God for the blessing of having a fellow minister in my house. I really appreciate the ministry of my wife, Pastor Millie. The Lord bless you for being such a pastor. Even to us at home, we thank you. We bless the Lord for you. Shall we pray? Father, we are so grateful that you are re- you're already here. You've been waiting on us. And I know, Lord, Every time you gather us in your presence, you always have something in store for us. And this morning, my prayer is that, Lord, that which you have purpose, that will minister to us, starting with me, Lord, speak to us, Lord, in a simple language that you can be able to understand, <clears throat> that honor and glory would go back to you. We give you praise. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. If you turn with me to the book of John chapter 10, and verse 10, the Bible says, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. People of God, it's One of the worst things that a human would uh, find himself in is a situation whereby you are living without a purpose. In life, each one of us should always have a purpose and when you discover your purpose, a lot of things fall in the rightful place because you know what God has put aside for you. And you know what? It's sad if the enemy, the devil himself, has a purpose and he knows his mission on earth. I'll be coming to part two of that. This scripture, I look at it as one of those scriptures that is a two-sided coin. One of the side present the reason and the purpose why the enemy came on earth. And you know what? It also reminds me of uh, a documentary that once in a while we watch. I enjoy football. I also love watching news. But once in a while when I have an opportunity to watch a documentary, especially on animals, my attention normally gets taken so seriously on how the pride of lions organize themselves to get their prey. And so, one of the things that you will watch if you you ever watch a documentary on the lions, the first thing they do is they isolate their prey. Whether it is a zebra, a waterbuck, or an antelope, they will focus, they will not attack when they are in the group they will focus on one or two particular animals which they will chase after. Of course, you know what happens. The old toothless lion up on the hill will roar to frighten and to scare the innocent animal. And in the process, they run, hoping they're running away from danger, only to push them towards the real danger where young, energetic lions are waiting to devour them. And you know what? I'm glad that the scripture also talks to us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 58. Uh, yeah. uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. I think it's verse 8, not 58, sorry. Verse 8. And the Bible talks about the devil, who is like, the Bible says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, 
the devil he prowls around like a lion like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour and you know what the bible describes the enemy as like meaning the enemy is a fake lion the real lion is the lion of judah when he roars everything trembles and everything comes into the rightful place amen i was looking at that scripture and for the young people maybe if today we had an opportunity to have this specific word bring back to me uh first peter chapter 5 verse 8 and if this word this particular scripture would be interpreted in sheng and in modern language in the in mtaani you'd hear somebody said oya karada karada na mgondi shaito ah ka macho adui anakusaka anakusaka kwa kona zote anataka kupiga ngeta akuwashe nare na kunyanyue karada and that's normally the plan of the enemy akunyanyue akuharibu bwana wetu asifiwe you know what john 10:10 and especially this part a that we've read brings three important issues that i want to take a very few minutes to run through three issues which are the main purpose why the enemy always is after your life and the bible brings it out that satan after isolating you his aiming is to steal you and you know what the process of stealing a believer begins by satan enticing us you and me with worldly pleasure once you get into the hook of wanting to enjoy the worldly pleasure he isolates you from god's people and once he isolates you from god's people the love of god start growing dim and low one of the things that you will notice as a christian who is growing dim and who is being stolen from the presence of god your prayer life goes down you don't have psych anymore to read god's word fellow believers becomes a burden ah kwani kwa sayote kwani lazima twende church finding pleasure in fellowshiping and attending right fellowship becomes an issue because the enemy is targeting to steal you from the fellowship and you know what it's so true the word of first corinthians chapter 15 verse 33 is a very prophetic word uh first Uh, Corinthians chapter 15 verses 33 talks about don't be fooled by those who say such things for bad company corrupts good morals meaning once the enemy has succeeded to steal you from the fellowship his main agenda is to ensure that there is nothing exciting about christian living and that's why coming for bible study is a burden coming to church early is a struggle being a member and a committed team member in whatever area where you are supposed to be serving is always a struggle because the enemy targets your soul to remove you from what will be the most important thing you know what this situation is we are being reminded of the book of genesis it started all the way when the fall of man took place and when sin came the bible says the angels drove them away from eden and just to remind us again eden represents the presence of god what a sad thing when the enemy manages and succeeds to take you away from the presence of god because you become an easy target of the second process and the second process is to kill and you know what we may not be able to it's so easy to know when somebody somebody has died physically it will be announced and we we've gone through quite a season this season but the worst part of death is the death the spiritual death of a christian 
the, the process of spiritual death begins with one becoming insensitive to the voice of God. One becoming, one starts looking at the Bible as a storybook, an old storybook that sometimes maybe might look boring. Prayer meeting, once somebody is dying spiritually, becomes an uphill task. I rather find a place to watch Manu playing with Chelsea than attend a prayer meeting on Monday. And that's the process of the enemy targeting to kill you, to kill me spiritually. It goes on, it doesn't stop there. At one time when we were properly dying, it also introduced into your life a hatred for Christians. You see a believer coming, somebody that used to say, praise the Lord. He comes from one corner on the streets and you want to change to look for another way to run away from such because they no longer appeal to you. You totally avoid church or fellowship. You know, it becomes like obvious. Coming to church becomes a story of the past. Child of God, I want to remind you that the enemy will never rest. He doesn't sleep until he makes sure that he has stolen you from the reward that is eternal. It becomes a very sad situation when you're dying spiritually and you meet a brother who knew you. I'm sorry, one of a very close friend of mine who is, uh, was once my pastor. One time I met him in Kisarian when I was working there. And I was so excited. We moved into this house and we met this man of God who, sorry to say, preached to me sometimes back when I was in Mombasa. And out of excitement, I went, praise the Lord. And you know, in that, in that time, I, I didn't know there was something that happened in his life. And then he goes... Uh, relax ndugu, relax, relax, relax ndugu. Udada na undugu yu ni story yako, relax. Then I realized, aya, kwani what happened? And that is so true to what happens in a Christian life when the enemy targets to kill you spiritually. The enemy does not get satisfied with killing you. He goes another step. Distraction. And you know what? The distraction process of a believer is the very situation that it's so eminent that this brother is backslidden Christian. And you know, at that particular point, when somebody is properly backslidden, now committing sin is not an issue of hiding. It is done openly. If you are in high school, you used to be a Christian and you happen to go to high school and you backslid, you find yourself being introduced to drugs and even pornography that some, some crazy boys carry even in, the, in, in, in their bag when they are in school. And you know what? In that state you find yourself that people live under an attitude of, attitude of disobedience. Both at home, in school, in church, these things can happen, especially when the enemy is now in the process of literally exposing you. When we start seeing so and so used to lead worship with us, but now he's finding himself in a bad drinking, that is just the resulting part of distraction that has taken place. When he destroys you, we now see the true character of somebody who used to be a Christian who is no longer a Christian. And that makes me very sad. I just wanted to mention those few. There are many examples that we can give of distraction that has taken place. A family man who used to love his wife so dearly, they would walk hand in hand, no longer finds it pleasure to walk with the wife. Introduction of Mpango Akando becomes the order of the day because distraction has taken place. The Lord forbid. But people of God, child of God, have good news. That was the other side of the coin. 
Let's flip the coin and look at this other good side. The Bible says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it in fullness. And you know what? The good news that I have for you this morning is that God is in the process of restoring what the enemy has stolen from us. He is very concerned about some very key issues in your life that could have been stolen. Sorry, if I forgot to mention to you what I'm talking about this morning, I'm saying God is in the business of restoring what the enemy has stolen. And that brings our message this morning. You know what? If restoration has to take place in our Christian walk with the Lord, it begins by first, the first step is for you to identify what has the enemy stolen from me? What do I perceive to be missing in my walk with God, in my day-to-day life? And I'm here also to pause and say I'm not insensitive to remember there are some of us also who lost some precious important issues in life. You lost a job because Corona came. You are kicked out of your place of work because the situation demanded that. Your relationship, when you are just about to say, yes, I do, and walk the aisle, that relationship was broken. And that is a stolen issue in our lives. And there are many other issues for us to give each one of opportunity to share some of the key issues that have been stolen in our life we will take time to finish. But the good news, once you have identified what has been stolen from you, and just like in any situation when a car has been stolen because uh, one of these toy things that men really love is a car. And once a car has been stolen, you and me know the first place to report is at the police station. My car, KDD, has happened. Something has happened. It is gone. And you are reporting to the police to take action. I want to remind you that precious things in our spiritual walk that needs to be reported if they are lost. Amen? You need to report. You need to report the matter. Some of us today, the enemy has stolen our livelihood. Job, businesses have gone down. Academic progress has dived down. I'm here to give you good news. Report to the highest office, not Kasarani Police Station. Report to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Some of you, or some of us, the enemy has stolen the joy of being a family. It's rare you find us sitting together, sharing meals together, and talking and laughing together. That joy of being a family is long gone. I'm good news for you. Report. The Lord wants to hear that and to take a plan of action. Some of us, we have our sons and daughters who have lost hope. Maybe because the results in Form 4 never came out so well and you had so much expectation and the expectations were gone down because instead of getting a B or an A that you are really looking for, this child has got a D plus and is like, now where will we take him? I'm, I have good news. Report to the Lord. Report to him. The Lord cares. The Lord has a better future in that D plus than what you'd imagine with an A. Because he's the one who has wired this girl, this son, the way he is. The third step that I want to uh, share about is you can claim what the enemy has stolen from you. You can claim the key issues that have been stolen from you. It's your right to claim. 
As I was reading a book read, uh, written by uh, Criflo Dollar, I pick a few quotes that have really encouraged me. He says that, and I quote, when life throws us into a curveball, a curveball, a curveball is something which is unexpected, something surprising, something disruptive. That's a curveball. We don't have to accept it. I don't know what curveball has been thrown in your life. Maybe you didn't expect to be told time is out. Your job is ending. And then all of a sudden there is this shortlisting because the organization has been doing so poorly and so retrenchment has come. And unfortunately the curveball has been thrown on you. You are among the least that who are being retrenched. Whatever issue that is going on in our lives right now, we must remember it's not over. Those are words from our friend Kriflo Dollar. Whatever the enemy stole, whether it's your health or your financial security or your peace of mind or anything else that you hold dearly, God is promising today to restore it. God is saying, I'm here, just report it. Lastly, he says, regardless of what Satan says, Jesus will have the last word because he is a restorer of our faith. He is with us, he is on our side, and he stands for us. Those are words from my learned friend, Kriflo Dollar. Jeremiah 30 verse 17 says, For I will restore your health to you. And I will heal you of your wounds, says the Lord. Let's read it again. For I will restore your health to you. I will heal you of your wounds, says the Lord, because they call you an outcast, saying, this is Zion. No one seeks her. It's true, you might go through some kind of rejection and isolated. You become an outcast, not because of anything you have chosen, but because just the way you've been created. And you know what? Even in that situation, the Lord says, I want to heal your wounds. People go through different wounds. Wounds which have, have been afflicted by friends, relatives. Wounds at work, wounds at home. And you are almost giving up this marriage because of some of these wounds. I have good news for you. The Lord is willing to restore that. The second thing in this step is that According to the spiritual laws God has established, when an enemy is caught, when an enemy is found, he is ripped off what he has stolen from you and is returned to you seven times. You know what? The thief requires to restore sevenfold of what he has stolen from you. What is it that has been stolen from? Is it business? The Lord is willing to restore it seven times. Is it the joy of being married? The Lord is willing to restore it seven times. Yes, we've been told the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God brings full restoration to the point where our life is overflowing. The Lord is promising that abundant life, that overflowing life, because we know where to report matters. Not to a fellow brother, not to a fellow sister, but to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The good news is that this King Jesus, the highest authority, the most secure place, uh, police station to, 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 to report in heaven, he's promising everything that will be restored back to you. Listen to Joel chapter 2, verses 23 20, uh, to 25. What does it say? So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling, uh, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust for great army which I sent among you. Verse 25, so I will restore to you the years that the swimming locust has eaten. I know we are in the year of mounting up with wings like an eagle. 
But God is not over with the process of restoring. I believe restoration is still going on even as we mount up with wings like eagles. Restoration is taking place. It's only a matter of asking yourself, Lord, where am I? What can you do about this life? I'm almost giving up. I've been waiting on you for all these years to find Mr. Right or Miss Right. And they come, they pause like they want to say something, they shy off, they go. This is the year of restoration and this is the year of mounting up with, the, with wings like eagle. He is willing to raise up a standard in that very situation. He is more than willing to give you the joy of salvation. Amen? If you've lost the joy of salvation, this is what the Lord wants to do. To bring back all the hope and the joy that was missing from your, our lives before we, uh, we are established we establish our relationship with him. When we, call, when we recall how we felt when we got born again, we realize that he has accepted us as his beloved children. He restores unto us the joy of salvation. And I'm here to speak to a brother, a sister. The joy of salvation is waxing cold because your life has been so much surrounded by worldly issues until the focus on, of living a Christian life is becoming, mm, it's going down. Psalms, remember what David prayed, one of the prayers that David was praying, creating me a clean heart. And verse 51, verses 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. When everything comes in us, Rejoice in the Lord. Make him your source of strength. Amen? When everything curves and it's like everything is coming to a collapse, put your focus on the Lord. Rejoice because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And you know what? I'm saying when everything curves on us, rejoice in the Lord because he makes you, he, he renews your strength. He renews your strength and he will cause you to walk on a higher ground. I remember one of the lovely songs we used to sing with the kids and we're still singing. God is a good God. Yes, he is. He is a good God. Yes, he is. What did he do? He lift me up. He turns me around. He set my feet on higher ground. God is willing to set your feet on higher ground where the enemy cannot reach you. Though the enemy may come in like floods, he raises a standard. I don't know what you're going through, but God is in the business of restoring good things in your life. God is indeed the God who wants to give you a second chance and turns your life around. What does Proverbs 6 and I'm reading verses 30, 31. Proverbs 6. The Bible says, People do not despise a thief if he, he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. Yet when he is found, he must restore sevenfold. He must have to give up the substance of his house. I pray that the Lord is going to put in you a holy hunger. A holy hunger that says, Satan, you cannot steal my prayer life. Satan, you cannot steal my love for God's word. Satan, you cannot steal my love for fellowship. And you pray that God may restore and you find pleasure. One reason, apart from a few who the nature of their work and commitment at work ties them that they cannot make it on a Monday prayer meeting. Sometimes the other side of the story is losing the joy of prayer. Where prayer is not so meaningful, it's not such an important meeting. But I pray that in these last uh, times that we are living, when you look at what is happening in the nation and surround us, we will make prayer, our prayer life, such an important agenda before the Lord. 
So if the enemy is caught, he must pay you seven times. But you have to report and start working on it. He has to restore your health. He has to res restore your wealth. He has to restore your good relationship. He has to restore the right attitude seven times. Bona yesu wa sifiwe. Nehemiah 8.10 Nehemiah 8.10 says God, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. Okay? And send to, uh, to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our, to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The moment you discover that there is every beautiful thing that you need in the Lord. And he gives you the peace of mind. And you find a, an opportunity to relax in the presence of the Lord. Indeed the joy of the Lord becomes your strength. Allow me to bring this sharing to a conclusion with these words in Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 2 to 5. I wish you could read together. This one I would want each one of us to participate and read together because there is something that the Lord wants us to know from this. The Bible says, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. According to all that I command you today, you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the Father's paths under heaven from there the Lord your God will gather you and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring to you the land which your fathers possessed and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more and more than your fathers. And that is a promise. I wish you would take each and every word that was promised by then. That promise is for you, the Israel of today. And you know what? When you discover the secret truth about that, then you'll discover that God is indeed, is in the process and is in the agenda of restoring what the enemy has stolen. I don't know what the, the enemy has stolen from your life this morning, but God is more than willing to embrace you, to say, I have called you, you are my own, you are my child, he knows you by name. If only you could rise up on your feet and we talk to God. I want us to just to take a moment of prayer and remember those few words, especially Deuteronomy chapter 5. And we tell the Lord to return us. If only we're going to walk in obedience, then that's the beginning of our breakthrough. Would we turn our hearts to God in prayer? Just, just take a minute and respond to that word as we pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for the truth concerning your word. Thank you that you are more than willing to restore what the enemy has stolen from us. Father, the love, the joy of salvation, would you restore it back a hundredfold? We need you, Lord. We cannot make it without you. We need you, Heavenly Father. Would you just do something spectacular, something new in our life? The things that you promise, oh God, would you follow it and bring it to a conclusion, Lord. We thank you. We bless you. We honor you. Have your way in our lives. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you.